We were on a road march. I was standing at the ring mount. And we were moving from one location to another. And we got hit with sniper fire. And a sniper bullet just whizzed past me. And I could see the tracer leaving. No more than an inch away from my head. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and real quick, before we get into our veteran story, I wanted to tell you about who we are and how you can help with this project. Memoirs of World War II is an organization run by myself and my family. We travel all over, interviewing the last living veterans of the Second World War and sharing their stories in this series to ensure that their service and this important history is never forgotten. We are funded by donations from people like you, both through Patreon, where you can choose what dollar amount you'd like to give, and through our website. So follow the links in the description below and you can be part of preserving this history. Thank you for your support. And now on to our veteran story. Although the Second World War had immersed much of Europe and Asia by 1941, the people of the United States were still living in isolation, unaware of how vast the conflict erupting around the globe had become. And this was the case for many people like Henry Narusevich, who did not realize the extent of the war until the unexpected attack on Pearl Harbor. I was down to visit my family in North Andover, and I was fixing a window that was broken in the kitchen when a neighbor come by and said the Pearl Harbor was bombed. And it was late in the afternoon when this happened, when we heard it. And I figured, well, they're not going to have much trouble with them there because I imagine they must have resisted them and fought them off. I didn't realize that, that the damage they had done, though, because I thought we were stronger than what we were at the time. But apparently not. I didn't realize the amount of forces that the Japanese had. And I was quite surprised. The following day, the United States was committed to bringing an end to the Second World War. As the war continued and a need for manpower increased, drafting became essential to the United States' efforts, and thousands of men like Henry would be called upon to serve. You start hearing the news about falling back here or there, you know, I think it's getting serious now. I didn't think they were going to call me because I was married. I, I had a child at that time, but they did. It affected my wife more than it did me. What, what could you do? Henry was placed with the U.S. Army's Armored Force, established to train soldiers in armored tactics and tank gunnery. I was a little bit disappointed because I wanted to get into the Air Corps, but I was sent into a book of tank, or tanks. But it wasn't bad. After I got used to it, it wasn't that bad. We were sent to Fort Knox for basic training. After basic training, they sent me to the Army School at Fort Knox to learn tank mechanics. They were going to keep me over at the Army School as an instructor, but then they said a directive come through saying that every able-bodied man was going overseas. So that... I just put it in the right perspective. They put us aboard a trap steamer, a Belgian, Belgian freighter, and we went over in a convoy, ships a quarter mile apart for as far as you can see. So it took us 14 days to cross the Atlantic. 10 days out of New York on that convoy, we got word that the invasion of France had started. That was D-Day. Two and a half years since the United States joined the war, British, Canadian, and American forces led history's largest amphibious assault in the face of virtually insurmountable German fortifications. Though the invasion claimed nearly 10,000 casualties, the Allies were no longer falling back, but pressing forward through the newly opened road toward Hitler's Nazi Germany.
About a month after D-Day, went by rail to Southampton, where we boarded a ship to cross the channel. And uh, we disembarked at Omaha Beach. Of course, Omaha Beach, there was no shooting going on there, but the wreckage from the D-Day invasion was still around there. I don't know how many ships were stuck, but there were ships all over the place stuck down. And then we marched in about, oh, probably about five miles, and we waited for trucks to pick us up. And they trucked us to a replacement center. Moving inland through France, Henry was tasked with being part of the forces that would push the German lines back as he was finally assigned to his unit in October of 1944. I got assigned to the 276th Armored Field Artillery Unit. Well, the first night we were there, as a member of the 276, we slept in a barn in, in Chenevers. And uh, shells started to come in. Well, it landed in front of the barn. The next one landed beyond the barn. So then we run downstairs because we knew the next one was going to be right on target. If one goes over, the next one goes under, the next one's going to be right on target. But they didn't shoot anymore. And then we were pulled away from there. And it's now we're with the Third Army and the General Patton. We stayed in the woods to keep undercover. We dug down to prevent us from getting tree bursts, you know. And that's when they started bombing. And we started sending shells out. The sky was lit up all night long with shells going over. The next day we went out and we're going through the area where they were shooting us, sending the shells and there's troops dead all over the place. And we were moving from one location to another and we got hit with sniper fire. And a sniper bullet just whizzed past me and I could see the tracer leaving, no more than an inch away from my head. I didn't think too much of that because it happened so fast. But the biggest thing that ever happened, we had a half track with a trailer behind it. And I had the last tour of duty for the night. So it was going into the morning hours, the sun was just starting to break through. And I walking around the, the trailer. I no sooner got around inside the trailer, a shell hit the trailer. I didn't even hear it come in. It was so close. But the fact that the trailer hit me from that shell burst Save me. Following the Allied forces' successful invasion of France, it seemed as though the Second World War was all but over. However, on December 16th, the German army launched a counteroffensive intended to cut through the Allied forces and turn the tide of the war in Hitler's favor. We were put on alert. We were going to be moving out somewhere, not knowing where we were going to go. And then just around the two days before Christmas, we got orders to move out about close to midnight. We were going to the Ardennes, or in other words, the Bulge. My job was to make sure those tanks were, were all running because they had one tank for each firing battery. The cold, dismal Battle of the Bulge lasted for over a month, with American forces often fighting from surrounded and outnumbered positions. But their resilience held out long enough to stave off German forces until the harsh weather lifted and supplies and reinforcements came pouring in. By mid-January 1945, the Allies had suffered more than 90,000 casualties, but emerged from the battle victorious. Following the Battle of the Bulge, the German forces began to crumble faster than ever, and Henry and the 276 continued their push, making their way further into Europe. Eventually, we ended up 
and go into Austria. This was around close to the month of May by this time. But we didn't go far into Austria. We were day or two and then we pulled out. We went into Czechoslovakia. And we stayed there for about a day or so before we found out that the war in Germany had ended. After six long years, a war ravaged Europe was finally at peace, freed from Hitler's tyrannical grasp. With the devastation and chaos behind him, Henry observed the fundamental elements of humanity in a world without war. Well, one thing about the, the villagers now, they used to have a town crier. They used to come out there and give the, the news of the day to the, pe to the people that were still in there. And in France, they used to come by with a drum, follow beat the drum. The people would gather and they'd start talking in French. When you go to Germany, they used to ring a bell and to gather the people around them and give them the news of the day. It was just funny in a way. It wasn't all combat. There was a lot of good things about it. Soon, Henry returned to the United States. In October of 1945, he was discharged and finally returned home to his enduring wife and his daughter. Hi everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode. Our goal is to capture as many World War II veteran stories as we can from all over the world, but we can't do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us through Patreon and check out our website, memoirsofworldwar2.com for more information. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Again, we want to thank you for your support and thanks for watching.